two, one. We're ready. Ah, uh, yeah, very good. All right, so I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Um, I'm Chrissy Rissmeyer, and I'm from UC Santa Barbara, and I'm here with Matt Critchlow from uh, UCSD to talk about the work that we've been doing collaboratively between our two campuses as part of something called Project Surf Surfliner um, and on our, specifically on our Spotlight product, which is uh, nicknamed Starlight. Um, so just really quickly, we thought it would be helpful to even talk about what is Project Surfliner. Um, so it is a newly launched collaborative project of the UC San Diego and UC Santa Barbara, Barbara Libraries to create our next generation Samvira based digital library products, uh, including technologies like Spotlight, which is in the larger Samvira adjacent ecosystem. Um, and we've nicknamed the project Project Surfliner after the Amtrak route that links our campuses together and that we take uh, to travel back and forth for meetings. Um, but we're also hoping that the collaboration may eventually expand to some of the other UC campuses. Um, but just more importantly, um, Project Surfliner is, is really about the collaboration effort and it's about building and leveraging the strengths, experiences, and resources of our campuses to focus on some shared concepts and products in a sustainable way. Um, so we've been trying to approach the collaboration in a really thoughtful manner, um, both mindful that what we're developing might be of interest to other folks, both within the UC system and, and within the larger community as well. Um, and so keeping that in mind, we, we do have a couple of general approaches that we're using to help guide the collaboration. I'm not going to go through all of these right now, but I did want to touch on the last one really quickly since it did affect some of the choices that we made when we were working um, on Spotlight. Um, and that's this idea of shared code and separate installations. Ideally, what we're trying to do is um, not have each campus have to maintain their own forks of the code. So we really are, um, we really truly do want to have a, a shared code base um, that each campus is using to deploy uh, to their own standalone systems. And so it means that a lot of the work that we're doing up front um, is to make it easy for us to do that um, without requiring additional local code changes or maintain that code separately uh, in their own code base. Um, so it's really, if the, the code can be pristine, but if we're not able to deploy it in another campus environment, that it's not really useful within our context. Um, and this principle in particular affected some of the work that we did so far in Starlight. Um, so our, the two initial products that we've been working on um, are Starlight, which is our exhibits platform based on, on Spotlight, and also Lark, which is our shared linked data authority platform. Um, we also did stick with the train theme. So um, Starlight is named after the Southern Pacific Starlight um, that operated between LA and San Francisco in the 40s and 50s. Um, and we just finished up our first 90 day collaborative work cycle. Um, and so uh, we're still uh, sort of finishing up some of the, um, the wrap up work related to um, that initial work. Um, so just really quickly to go through um, that initial local feature work and um, also hoping to do a live demo. So hopefully this will go well. Um, I do want to just point out that we did have um, quite a large team that was working on this. Um, I served as the primary product owner uh, and Matt um, served as the technical lead, but we also had a, a, an additional product owner from San Diego participating, um, several developers from Santa Barbara, uh, and also some subject matter experts uh, in ops and um, theming um, from San Diego. Um, so I'm going to touch on sort of the demoable feature work, and then Matt's going to talk about some of the more um, sort of infrastructure feature work that we did after I'm done. Um, so just really quickly, um, before I begin that demo, I do want to mention that we are hoping to contribute as much of this local work uh, as possible back to the core spotlight. Um, especially those things that might be of interest to the larger community. Um, and so we are really excited to see all the information coming together in the community roadmap document, um, since it really is helping us inform some of our uh, future work. All right, so now I'm going to attempt uh, to switch over to another browser window um, to go through um, 
uh, these features that we did. So the first is um, a batch upload of objects from a server-based file system, um, and then import and display of PDFs uh, as standalone exhibit objects, and then global theming via the UI. So let's see how this goes. So I did um, sort of create this demo exhibit. Um, sorry, I need my, my demo files. Um, which I have in multiple windows. Okay, so um, I did create this demo exhibit and I'm just gonna go through really, really quickly. Um, oh, come on, there we go. Um, and um, quickly demo some of that work. Um, so as I hope you all know, um, Spotlight natively supports batch, batch ingest um, using um, files, um, that are openly accessible on the web. Um, but we wanted to um, support uh, using locally mounted storage as it's already part of our curator workflow. Um, and we found that it's, it's a more stable method for us. Um, so if I go to this upload multiple items, um, I actually have already customized a template that I'm going to use, um, but I do wanna go ahead and download the template and I'm also gonna switch so you can see my entire screen if I can figure out how to get back to that window. All right, I can't. So I'm just gonna go switch back to my slides real quick to show you um, the, the one thing that we need to do when we, um, after we download that template is you'll see um, when it comes out of Spotlight, it will say URL in this column. Um, and we just have to customize um, that header to say file so that the code knows that it's actually gonna be pulling from a file server. And you'll see here, this is a file path to one of our, um, uh, local file stores. And so if I just pop on over and choose the file that I want to upload. Sorry, our network is really slow today because it's um, dead week before finals. Right, so here's my batch CSV. I'm just gonna go ahead and open that. Um, and this does have that file path in there. I'm gonna go ahead and click that. And while those items are uploading, um, so we can go back to them. Um, I did wanna talk about the next um, piece of work that we did, um, which was um, uploading PDF. So we can already start seeing some of those come in. Um, is uploading PDFs as standalone exhibit objects. And that's one of the things that when we started working with our stakeholders, um, we know that, that Spotlight out of the box has um, standalone single image support. So you can upload a single image into, um, as an exhibit object into your Spotlight instance. Um, but much of uh, the Spotlight features do assume that you're connecting it to a, a digital library or a digital repository platform, um, which we do plan to eventually do on both campuses, but we have um, lots of use cases where um, it just, it wasn't something that our stakeholders wanted to always have to put something into our digital library platform to pull it in. Um, and so that um, we decided that we wanted to really extend the file type support uh, for Starlight beyond just images. Uh, and so started that work uh, with the ability to upload PDFs as standalone objects. So I'm just gonna go through, um, demo that really quick. just as a single item upload. Um, so here I have a PDF um, for one of our student newspapers, which is the Eagle. And this is from, just gonna, I'm a metadata librarian, so it's really tough for me not to like put in full metadata, um, but I'm just gonna add in a couple things here. All right, so now we've seen um, a bunch of things have popped up from my um, previous upload. Just gonna refresh it to see if the PDF has shown up. Okay, there it is. Um, so now if I go to this object page, uh, and this was work that they did was they actually swapped out the native viewer um, 
for a different viewer, but you can see all of the pages of the PDF. Come on, keep scrolling. There we go. Um, also zoom in and rotate and do all that good stuff um, and download it. Oh, yeah, we're getting lots of lag on the network today. All right. Uh, and then the, the final thing that I wanted to show is um, the theming work that we did. Um, so while Spotlight Core does have this ability to uh, theme at the exhibit level, so just going into appearance and you can select your local theme and so if those changes. Um, one of the things that made this really challenging was that the theming um, um, doesn't extend to the entire site and what as uh, uh, Spotlight Core requires that you actually hard code the views for much of your site. Um, and this didn't work for our shared code environment because we were um, needing to actually share the code and deploy that in separate instances. And so some of the work that we did was this ability to apply a global theme and also um, give it as, as what we call um, sort of more power. Um, so I'm just gonna pop over back to um, the home page for our demo site and go into customize appearance here. And so you'll see that there's now, in addition to what you would normally see in Spotlight, um, this uh, ability to apply a site-wide theme. And this doesn't override exhibit specific theme selections, um, but does allow uh, a super admin from the UI to go ahead and select that global theme. Um, the other thing it does is it has some um, additional power um, over the, the header and the footer um, that allowed us to um, do more with the theming than we were able to out of the box. Um, and so that is, I think, all of um, what I was going to talk about. And so I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to Matt. So I think uh, a couple of things I can touch on um, sound somewhat similar to some of the work that Lynette's done recently. Um, we, because we knew, as Chrissy said, we have this fairly short uh, work cycle, 60 to 90 days. We wanted to make sure that we could come up with a configuration management and deployment solution that both campuses would be able to ship to production at the end. And so we, uh, we both have vSphere VMware infrastructures locally still and primarily use uh, either Red Hat Enterprise Linux or CentOS. And so we landed on that and we also both had some experience with Ansible and so what we created for this first round was a set of Ansible roles and a playbook which would let us each deploy to our local infrastructures. Um, and that's worked out well. So it sets up things like Postgres and Apache and Passenger and Solar. Um, and we, yeah, thanks Chrissy. And so we're uh, trying to adhere to the 12 factor uh, application pattern as much as we can. So we've extracted a lot of things from the application is as many things as we can into environment variables, which let um, each of our institutions sort of toggle things that make more sense for our own uh, deployment needs and purposes. Um, and let's see. Yeah, so there's, there's a host of examples. Um, single sign on is probably one that we could touch on um, a little bit more. We um, so one of the changes that we made is the default, um, so the default Spotlight database authentication solution comes from the device gem and uses database authentication, which makes a ton of sense for a framework. Um, our campus uh, security policy won't let us store uh, user credentials like passwords in local databases for our web applications. So our UC system supports uh, SAML or Shibboleth, and so that was the that was the choice that we made to implement. And so we um, so we're using the Omnioth and then the Omnioth Shibboleth gems to plug in to devise and handle the authentication piece. Um, this has actually worked well technically. 
Um, and here at UCSD, we, we have that working. Um, however, from a communication standpoint, we, we sort of realized about halfway through that that was a bit more of a struggle than we had anticipated um, because the process for getting this, the certificates for doing single sign-on requires, uh, at least for both of our campuses, going through a central campus IT group or really more in reality one person. Um, and so while, again, while this works technically, we're actually in the middle of sort of reevaluating this choice. Um, we may, uh, it looks like we're probably going to at least add Google OAuth since uh, all UC campuses primarily, I think, except for Merced also have G Suite now, and that integrates nicely with OmniAuth. So at the very least, Google OAuth will probably become an option for Starlight, um, if not potentially replace Shibboleth. Um, let's see, you probably go to the next slide, Chrissy. And then we, so as I said, we had a, we had a short work cycle. And so we, we chose to use infrastructure and tooling that we were already familiar with, but we knew that what we eventually wanted to get to was, um, being able to have a cloud native infrastructure and take advantage of things like, uh, continuous delivery. So. Uh, the other product that Chrissy mentioned, Lark, is actually taking advantage of this already. Um, it was a bit smaller in scope of a project, and um, so it's been a great learning experience and I think will help us shift over to um, making some of these things possible for Starlight and Spotlight apps. Um, at the moment, we already have a Docker image that's built for the application. We have a Docker Compose environment that developers can use locally. Um, we're using GitLab for CI, and so um, we are, we're running a true CI pipeline and using containers for um, running our test infrastructure. But what we want to get to is actually deploying the application um, on Kubernetes with a home chart. We, we each have a local rancher instance, um, and if rancher is not familiar to you, it's essentially kind of a really nice wrapper around Kubernetes, which has uh, user interface that makes it very easy to sort of through web forms do things like deploy home charts and deploy applications, um, set up projects and do some configuration, which ordinarily you'd have to have in uh, Kubernetes config files. Um, and so because each of our campuses have that, we're sort of exploring um, doing multiple deployments to each of our rancher clusters, um, which is already working for Lark. Um, so yeah, next step for for us with infrastructure is is getting Helm chart built. Um, and that's gonna involve, you know, some new things we haven't done yet in terms of getting solar and Redis and sort of the other main key parts of the infrastructure for a Starlight app um, containerized properly and managed. So um, yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions about that, but I know we're pretty near 15 minutes. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Chrissy, and thank you, Matt. Does and anybody I did, have any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. I did just have a few couple of things I wanted to oh. sort of add. Um, sorry. Is that, uh, it's okay. I couldn't unmute myself. I lost my mute button. Um, so I just wanted to touch really briefly on sort of what we're planning on doing next. Um, I think it is important to note that we don't actually have a Spotlight instance in production right now. We just finished up that work cycle. And so what the local teams are working on now is, is rolling this out to stakeholders. And so part of this work, we are working on developing um, a documentation site that's very much based on the work, the wonderful work that Stanford has done. So thank you, Kathy. Um, and then we're also um, working on developing local training. Um, but the next piece that we're going to be doing is working with our stakeholders to determine next steps uh, for the development piece of the collaboration. Uh, and, and as part of that, we are going to be reviewing the community roadmap document both to identify um, other work in the community that has already done, that's already been done that may fulfill some of our local requirements, um, but also to see if there's perhaps other institutions that we can connect with on getting some of this work done and perhaps contributed back to the core base, uh, base for everybody. So really excited about that piece. And that's it. Thank you. Um, 
Chrissy and Matt. Ooh, I want to ask you one question first. Um, so um, I was looking at your um, I was looking at your toolbar for that uh, documentation, um, and I realized that you and I had never reconnected. Were you able to successfully import that JSON export that I sent you? No. Oh. <laughs> and actually, but, but Kathy, what we haven't determined yet is we do have a problem actually right now um, in the Starlight. We have a, a bug ticket. We, for some reason, cannot export sites currently. And so um, before, and we can't import the site, but we don't know yet if it's a problem we have, which is not able to import any sites, or if it's a particularly a problem with not being able to import a JSON that was made on a sort of different fork of the code base. So that is an outstanding ticket. And I will totally follow up with you once we're actually able to fully test just even a round tripping of a, of a locally created exhibit. Um, I, I would love that. I think that would be great. And I also think that our working together in that way um, could benefit the greater community. Um, folks, what Chrissy was trying to do, of course, is not reinvent the real wheel 100%, but to take um, the Stanford exhibits documentation exhibit, which we call our EOE for short. Um, that's published for the world to see. So um, if you haven't seen it before, but she was trying to take our EOE, be able to import that exhibit, and then only only change the things that she needed to change, right? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and I would imagine that other people might like to be able to do that. So um, we hope that that's possible. And if anybody else wanted to experiment with that, like Vanessa, if, if um, you wanted to just try that out, I'm happy to um, send you that JSON file and you could see if it works. Yeah, I would say, especially oh, if yours is, if your import export is working, that would be a better, a, a faster test than I'm able to do right now. Yeah, I'm happy to run a test for folks. We do, I do actually use the import export feature um, for actually training, setting up training exhibits. Um, for this case though, for documentation, I, what I, I decided to do was um, on my documentation site, I just decided to link to the specific points that were relevant in Stanford's documentation. And so I just linked directly there, which is mostly the, the, wib the widgets um, documentation. So that way, if that stuff gets updated, we'll get those updates. Because um, yeah, because a lot of this stuff was Stanford specific that I, you know, we didn't want to copy at all. Sure, um, I'm just cognizant of time here. Do, does anybody have a question about the UCSB, UCSD, about the Surfliner presentation before I stop the recording? Uh, Matt and Chrissy, nice job. I would encourage you to go ahead and put, you, put some documentation up on our wiki and the institutional sites because you're doing a lot of nice work there that other people have been asking about. So it'd be great to see your, uh, to see some of it up there, even though you, you haven't gone production with an instance, I, I think it's good work. Thank you. And, and we have, I know we've shared uh, this work in the community roadmap, but we'll also as part of our rollout, make sure that we're updating the, um, the larger spotlight community wiki as well. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.